Welcome back to Starting Your Own Meadery, or a guide to starting your own meadery with Billy Belts. Um, I am happy to host him as he teaches us all about starting our own meadery. Based off his experience, he is the co-owner of Lost Cause Meadery, and they are a world-famous meadery producing a plentiful styles of mead, and uh, I have no doubt that we're going to learn a lot about this um, next step for our mead making journey. We learned in last one about the business model. What does it mean to even start building your business? And this is kind of the idea creation phase. So if you did not watch that one, listen to it, go back, listen to it. For our second part, we're going to talk about the business plan and the actual funding of the meadery. Two very important things. So we've graduated from our business model. We decided we're not going to use any examples here because there are too many for us, to, too many rabbit holes we could jump down. But let's say we've decided on our business model. What are we, what are we talking about here with the business plan? Yeah, business plans are, um, they're funny uh, because they are absolutely necessary and totally worthless, like completely worthless. <laughs> um, but you have to have one. Yeah. And I know that's you know, what a weird. start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean business plan? <laughs> uh, don't even think about it. <laughs> yeah, I got you. It, it's um no, you have to it they're they're necessary not just to have, but to go through the process of doing. Uh you absolutely need to create a really well thought out um complete business plan before you start putting money towards anything. Absolutely. The reason I say they're worthless is because all those numbers that you will spend months putting together, uh, once you launch three, six months into the business, those numbers don't mean anything. <laughs> and almost all, unless unless you're you're just a uh, unless you really nail it, um, they won't mean anything. And that's fine. That's that's expected. The business plan is not necessarily to have a document that says uh, this is actually like this is, if we're not going to stray from this, this is exactly what is going to happen in the future. It's more of a document that says, I have thought through every single part of my business and I have uh, a solution and an answer for everything. And it really, really gets critical um, when you start looking at the numbers. Mm. You know, most of a business plan is actually all the numbers at the end, all the spreadsheets. And you're, you know, like we talked about last time, you're not a mead maker anymore. You're a business owner, mm. which means um, you have to account for all those numbers and you need to understand them and make sure they work. So, so yeah, it's, it's a, um, it's a fun journey, uh, and, but it's a necessary journey. Mm. So the things that are the most critical, um, you know, you're going to talk about your, 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 yourself, uh, the business concept, um, your competition, um, the process, all these things are critical for your business plan. And, and we won't get into that because you can, there's so many resources online for doing a business plan, right? Mm -hmm. Um, the really critical areas are, like I said, the numbers at the end. So the, um, the financial forecasts, um, the spreadsheet showing startup capital and where those expenses are, are, are going to be. And, mm. um, the cost of goods, which is something, uh, a lot of people starting out don't really take into consideration with their, the budget that they'll need to start a meadery. Um, those, those cost of goods to actually get your first, Oh, you mean like uh, ingredients? Okay, uh, I'm following you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Um, so like cost of goods, meaning um, everything that goes in to make a batch of mead, package it, mm. and be able to sell it. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so so though, all those components of a business plan are, the, are I think, are the most critical because um, you have to make those numbers work. And if you kind of skim through it or you – you use, I don't know, AI probably at this point makes business plans for people. Yeah, but probably. if you don't actually do it yourself, uh, you could find yourself in a, in a world of hurt. If you, if you don't understand those numbers and you can't and you, you're not uh, making sure that everything you're doing um, will end up um, leaving you, 
you know, with some um, with some money at the end, yeah. with some cash at the end. Yeah, to keep the business going, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and anyone starting a business will hear this from everybody. Um, you know, whatever your budget is, uh, double or triple it because all these things come up, and it's true. So you can't forecast. You can't forecast everything. There's so many things when you're starting a business that will come out of nowhere um, and be huge expenses mm. and and really um, piss you off. But <laughs> it happens, and we all we all overcome it. Mm -hmm. um, the key is thinking through the stuff that you can predict. So, um, do you create so, in that circumstance? I mean, yes, you're you're doubling, tripling the budget. How do you, how do you, other than that, financially, uh, prepare for that? Do you just always set aside more money and go, I know something's going to happen, so I'm just, here's $10,000 for when that, that thing explodes? Or is it just a preemptive mental preparation, willingness to spend the extra money when it happens? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's kind of both. I mean, you, you, you you're not going to be able to have a lot of money. Most of us won't be able to have a lot of money set aside for, mm -hmm. for these kind of things. Uh, most of us are bootstrapping it um, in the meat industry. Yeah. We're all, we're all kind of pulling this together however we can yeah. um, when we start. But what it really means is if, if your business plan and all your financial forecasts and everything says you need, you know, say $200,000 to make this work, like everything adds up to $200,000 and the most you can get is $200,000, that's a red flag. Mm. If your business plan says everything that you can think of, you've run through all the models um, and you need $150,000 and you have $200,000, now we're okay. You're, you're still probably gonna go over $200,000, but you at least have yeah. some room and there's a lot of creative ways. We'll talk about this uh, later on too. There's creative things you can do. And as a business owner, you're never going to stop having to come up with creative solutions that are thrown out of at you out of nowhere. So like, don't sweat it. Like you're going to go over budget and it's going to be fine. Business owners are, um, you know, you got to be scrappy and you got to figure things out. And so that will come. Uh, but you can't the, really the red flag is if everything, all the numbers say you're at this number and mm -hmm. that's absolutely all you can scrape together. Um, maybe take a step back, see if there's other th decisions or things you can make to bring that budget down. Cause you're going to need some buffer. Yeah, that makes sense. So well, yeah. let's talk about funding then, because obviously we're on the topic of money. And uh, I guess my first question is before we get into actually sitting down and getting the money being a, a meter that has both carbonated side and still side would you say my first thought is carbonated is probably gonna be more expensive but am i right in saying that carbonated me generally is more expensive to make when it comes to equipment and those sorts of things um i don't think it breaks down by that as much um <laughs> okay but it's a fair it's a fair assumption because what you will need if you are making um, for the most part if you are making a lot of draft meads um, you're going to need a way to uh, chill these meads and um, and carbonate them and serve them mm -hmm. chilled. And so that could mean a stainless steel tanks and a glycol system mm -hmm. and then a cold box, you know, a walk-in to have your meads on draft mm -hmm. and, um, you know, uh, a bunch of kegs and a tap system. And, and these are all, um, I mean, anything that whenever you hear the word stainless steel, you know, that's, that's red flag. <laughs> ah, yeah. Money. I mean, it's, it's yeah. great because yeah. um, we're still using the tanks and the kegs we got when we started six years ago. Right. So um, it's, but it's, it's an in initial capital investment that you have to make on the, on the still side. Um, you, you might not need some of that, but you also, um, it doesn't mean that you don't like we, we ferment everything 
in, well, not everything, but 90% of our meads are fermented uh, fermented in stainless steel because mm. we want absolute perfect temp control, mm. whether that's going to be a draft mead or, you know, a big, rich dessert still mead. Um, I still want temp control to to the, the degree mm-hmm. um, because um, that's how you make amazing mead. And well, that's part of it. There's many things that go into it, but that's one. So still need stainless tanks, still need glycol system. Um, and so it, it depends though, if you are making, you can also start, and we'll talk about this when we get into budget. Um, you don't have to have stainless in a glycol system. Mm-hmm. You can get by doing, um, let's say, let's say you're really strapped for cash, um, but you really want to make this work and you're, you're going to do, um, you know, uh, wine style meads. Um, you can absolutely make fantastic meads in plastic, like plastic drums, plastic totes, mm-hmm. using flex tanks um, where there's still sanitary fittings, tri-clamp fittings. It, you're, it's going to be an eighth of the cost of stainless. You don't need a glycol system. And you you do it in, like, say you have an, a room you can control mm. um, ambient temp. Uh, and maybe instead of doing a big refrigeration system, you get a um, a mini split AC for a thousand bucks, and you get one of those, um, well, the things that uh, what are they called? Not Robo Cools, but um, there's things you can get online for like 150 bucks, and they allow you to push the temp of your mini split or or window AC unit down to like oh, the 50s. Yeah, so now you can have a, a temp controlled room fermenting in plastic, so you can control uh, the the fermentation, and even if you want to do sparkling um maybe you uh, are going to do bottle conditioning where that doesn't require any um, drop of temp mm-hmm. uh to uh to bottle condition or do a secondary fermentation in the bottle or the or can or keg so it mm-hmm. it really depends um but yeah there's your your uh your budget will be based on how the meat is going to be made and then also how it's going to be served right mm-hmm. Um, uh, um, in terms of initial capital, making mead and packaging it in bottles and pouring from the bottle is going to be much lower capital investment than building out a draft system. Yeah. However, in the long run, you're going to have much higher margins serving something off of a keg than pouring, than you know, yeah. bottling, corking, and then just pouring it out of that bottle. So yeah. um, that's another consideration. Interesting. Well, I I asked that because in my little bit of research I've done about carbonated meat especially, um, I know you need a bright tank and like you just said, glycol chiller and all these things, like it, it is a lot of um, investment. But I, again, not, lots of naive thoughts here that I'm learning uh, along with everybody at home. So Let's now actually talk about the awkward part of everything, and that's funding. Nobody really likes to talk about money because it's kind of spooky, uh, especially when you start talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. But how do we get there? How, how do we, this theoretical mead we're, meadery we're making in our brain, how do we fund it? What are some uh, ideas <laughs> for us? Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about funding, and then we'll, let's finish on, like, I can go through an actual budget yeah. of what might be required. That'd be um, awesome. So there's there's a number of ways to get funding, and this is where the business plan comes back. And a well thought out written business plan is a necessary tool in many cases to get any kind of funding at all. So that's the other reason why it's necessary. Um, so start, first place to start, probably obvious friends and family. Mm. Um, they are going to give you the best uh, uh, option in terms of a loan, hopefully, mm-hmm. if they like you. Um, and, uh, you know, not all of us have friends and family that have any money to invest or want to invest. But if you do, and you're lucky enough to um, go down that route first and really put yourself out there, um, you know, make sure everyone knows how much uh, passionate you are about this project, what it means to you. A lot of friends and family are not going to either invest or loan based on, um, you know, the return they're getting. All they want, they want to support your passion and they want to make sure you've thought through it, right? They don't, 
they don't want to lose all their money and they also don't want to invest something that's just going to fall apart anyways. Right. So, um, so that's why the business plan is, is a big deal, but put yourself out there. You never know. We, we, we got, um, a, a small loan, but some help from a, a friend that we would have never expected, um, who just was, uh, from our home blue homebrew club, who just absolutely loved what we were doing and had the ability to help us out. And that was fantastic. So, Start there. Um, next, a bank loan. Um, bank loans right now, I, I think when we started in 2017, it was probably a little easier because, uh, you know, breweries couldn't fail at the time. And, yeah. um, you know, now there's a lot that are, are are failing. So I don't know what the the what it's like out there for bank funding in our industry at the moment. But um, banks are going to look for... Um, a great business plan, you know, you're not going to be able to go to like the SBA in most cases and get a the ideal loan um, because SBA usually requires two years of business uh, in order to like fund. They're usually funding, okay, you've been in two years, proof mm-hmm. of concept, now you're going to expand or whatever. Yeah. But your, your community bank uh, or the community, the local branch of larger bank, um, they do want to invest in the community. That's what they do with their money, mm-hmm. right? Uh, banks put it back into the community, investing in small businesses mm-hmm. for a lot of times. So um, go put yourself out there. Go to every bank. Pitch it. You never know who is going to fund it. Um, go to the local brewery or winery or cidery in your town. See how they got their funding. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, like what happened with us, we found out there was a bank um, and it was the local branch of Chase, which is a huge bank. Um, and they, for some reason, they were just really into supporting local breweries and craft beverage companies at the time. And so that's how we got um, a lot of our funding is just a regular bank loan. Uh, but they kind of had a couple of people that specialized in that area or were passionate about it. So so go ask, who, how are other people, how have they gotten their funding? Um, and then follow up there. Uh, if you can't get a bank loan, don't worry. A lot of uh, commu- a lot a lot of cities and towns will have a community lender that is maybe a nonprofit, hmm. and what they're they're designed to lend to businesses starting out that can't get funding from banks. Hmm. Um, so, like San Diego has a few. The rates aren't as good. So you may be paying, um, I mean, this was 2017. I don't know what it would be now, but you you may be paying closer to like a eight to nine percent interest. Um, but they're there, they exist to provide funding to a lot. You know, if you think about uh, small businesses, like someone starting a um, tree cutting business, right? And they only need 60 grand to get a couple pieces of equipment. Um, That's what these guys are are funding. And the terms aren't as good. You may have to put up some things as collateral, um, but a lot of them are nonprofits and they're just doing this for the community. Um, So that's a good place to go and and seek out uh, community lenders. Um, Other option is banks, really like to loan, um, do equipment loans more than like business loans mm. because equipment, they can, they can, uh, lend on it and put a lien on it, which means if the, if a business goes under that equipment is theirs, mm. they get it, then take it and resell it. And it's just more stable to them. There's something they can actually say that they're putting money towards. And it's really, it's really theirs until you pay it off. Right. Yeah. Um, so equipment loans. If let's say you're going, you're going big. You're going to do uh, production metery, a, a whole stainless steel tanks, glycol system. Um, you could get a lot of that just as like a separate equipment loan, hmm. and those are easier to get funded. So, so that's an option. Yeah. Um, another option is if you have a four hundred one k, there you you can move the 401 401k into your new business and then pull out a loan against it. Hmm. I think up to 50%. Um, now 
I, I, I'm not a banker. This is not financial yeah. advice. This is just <laughs> what was available when we were starting. Yeah. But um, if you do have a lot of money in your 401k, um, you, there's things you can do to not necessarily like pay the penalty and, and do an early withdrawal. You can actually transfer it to the new business, loan against it, get a decent rate. And then you're just, you're paying that 401k back over time. Um, uh, but again, talk to your, uh, talk to your accountant or someone to make sure that's, <laughs> yeah, you can do that. Um, and then, uh, and then there's kind of, uh, apart from loans, there's right investors. So um, that's a whole different thing. Uh, that's very personal, like what you are um, providing back. There's traditional investing where someone may get um, a piece of the business or they're getting a, a certain payout. Um, you really have to be careful there because if you're giving away part of your business early on, and and you undervalue it, which you probably have to do if you have mm -hmm. if you're just starting out and it's a metery, um, you know you're giving up a, a a lot to get just to get going. Whereas um, you know a loan, you're not giving up any part of the business. So if you're going to do well, you get it's going to pay off. Mm. Um, other thing with investors is you also don't want to overpromise. Um, you know meteries aren't getting bought by AB InBev right now, so yeah. like. If someone's looking for a, a buy a big buyout, uh, I you know I don't you 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 can promise that you'd be the first metery to to have a big sale, right? Huh. Um, and then uh, you also want to make sure you know there you're being very clear about what say they will have in the business. You you and this comes you know if you're ha getting any friends or family involved, especially um, uh, or a partner. If you're getting a partner, you're bringing a partner on board, they've got the capital, you're the mead maker, um, get a lawyer involved. I, it doesn't matter what, how much you love this person or trust them. I've been through this a couple of times, um, not with lost cause, but otherwise, uh, get a lawyer involved and they can make sure everything is written out, hmm. Who, how the decisions will be made, who, you know, how involved each person. Uh, um, uh, uh, person will be, and you want that all written out. You do not want to enter in on on trust in a handshake and yeah. something like. That. Yeah, I can see where that'd be. It's a it's a tough like that's another part of the money game. It's like especially personal money that can be probably the most scary part. So walk us through a, a budget. You just said a moment ago you uh, you might be able to give us a better maybe bird's eye view of what we're actually looking at. Yeah, so um, it's going to depend on a ton of factors. So take everything with a grain of salt. Um, it'll really depend on your business model. So if, if you haven't watched the previous video, watch that because that will dictate what you need in the budget. Uh, yeah. Your main expenses are going to be um, the build out of your space. And if you haven't been involved with this, it's going to be uh, a lot more than you think mm -hmm. it is. But there's a lot you can do, um, and, and I'll talk about that. Um, it's going to be your equipment. And so we kind of talked about, you know, plastic, it's going to be a lot cheaper than stainless and a glycol system. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, your lease. So later we'll talk about, um, um, licensing, but in order to get a TTB license, which you have to have, um, a federal license to be a winery, um, they actually require a lease. So you have to get a lease signed before you can even apply and the TTB is not known for quickly yeah. approving things. So you may be paying on that lease um, uh, four to six months before you're actually licensed to make alcohol. And then from there, then you're starting to make meat. Right. So you have to, and with the build out, um, you may not get approval for, uh, you know, your state licensing until the build out is approved. And if that's a year long process, um, you're paying a lease that entire time. So a lease is a big part of the initial budget. You have to, you have to understand that there, there is no, there's no way you're only paying like two to three months of rent and then like opening um, for the most part. Right. I guess there's always an exception. Uh, and then cost of goods, you need to know your cost of goods. That's, you know, a big part of, you have to have enough product to sell and, and keep selling. 
Um, and all that investment comes out of that initial budget. So those are the things to think about. If uh, if you are planning, let's say, to do um, a, a metery that has, um, let's say, like three to four stainless steel fermenters, um, unit tanks, which can also be used like a bright, um, and let's say relatively small, five to seven barrel, mm-hmm. um, and a glycol system, and a small tasting room with a uh, with a walk-in cooler or, or walk-in fridge uh, uh, um, to to put your kegs to have a draft system, and um, a nice cozy tasting room. Uh, all in, the minimum is like two hundred thousand dollars for that, and wow. I don't want that to seem scary. Yeah. But um, you you have to. You have to just understand what you're getting into. Now, here's where, um, and that's minimum. There's It can go up quickly from there. Here's how you save some money. Um, and if you don't have $200,000, well, even if you do, yeah. even if you do <laughs> here's how you save money um, and some things to consider. First, you can do what I did. Uh, I went in with a cidery as an alternating proprietorship. We both wanted to do this we neither of us had enough money to do it right the way we wanted we wanted the stainless steel tanks the the glycol system um and a a big tasting room Mm -hmm. uh so we went in together as an alternating proprietorship you can do that as a wine license and i i just encourage people do not be scared of of sharing space with others Mm -hmm. you it's especially for me it's going to help you more than it hurts Mm -hmm. Um, people know cider, people know wine. These are some businesses you can share space with. Uh, you'll have cu- custom, you know, customers even coming in, not for your meat that are going to be trying meat. So you have a benefit there, but, um, you can save a lot on initial capital costs. And I won't get too into that, but please look at alternating proprietorship, get creative. Um, there's, you know, sometimes a already established winery, will allow you to come in, do an alternating proprietorship, either make your 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 mead there or even set up a little side tasting room. And, you know, it, it helps them. Maybe they're only using their equipment four months a year. So um, look into alternating proprietorship as a way to really cut costs. Um, you can go plastic. We talked about plastic fermenters uh, and, and not going all stainless. Um, you can... Uh, buy, if you are doing stainless, you can buy everything direct from China, like literally work with the, um, the manufacturer in China. Hmm. Um, it's, it's a, it's a gamble, <laughs> but breweries, at least in San Diego, and there's a meadery that just opened fantastic meadery, uh, wild west meat, uh, um, in North San Diego County. They got everything, um, kegs, all of their, their like seven barrel fermenters from, um, a manufacturing facility in China and they did it because there was a brewery that had done it previously. And so they trusted and they actually got everything custom made um, for way cheaper than saying, uh, you know, now if you have the money buy American, you're going to get a uh, better steel. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I'm not saying, uh, you know, go direct to, to China for everything, but it, the reality is it's going to be a lot cheaper if you're looking to save money. Yeah. Um, other thing about stainless is it, it doesn't go bad. So go to an auction, check out auctions. There's unfortunately, you know, stuff coming up all the time. Um, you can look at um, leasing kegs instead of buying them. If you're going to go big on draft, mm-hmm. um, which is what we did, that saves a lot of capital. Um, and so there's some of the things to think about to, to shave off that, that budget. Interesting. Well, that, that definitely helps that again, that bird's eye view, I'm sure people have been writing notes and things. I hope they are at least because you're, you're spouting a lot of very important knowledge for us. So we've talked about for this part, that business plan and our funding and talking about those things in our next one, we're going to get into, as Billy alluded to the licensure, the uh, building side, and maybe a little bit more about equipment. We've kind of briefly talked about the equipment, but from my experience, I know that this next topic takes, a, not from my experience watching my buddy go through making a metery, I know the building side can be really uh, interesting um, experience whenever you're really getting into it. 
So, Billy, thank you for imparting great knowledge about uh, these first two parts. Again, if you've not heard the first one, which was all about the, the business model, please, please, please go listen to it. And hopefully you've listened to all of this one. Um, we're now going to go talk about some even more in-depth things. We're just going further and further down. Eventually we'll be at the bottom, but we're just at the top of the cake right now. So, thanks, Billy. Cheers.